this nice lady has uh, initially seen here for her diabetic <laughs> ulcer. Um, first thing looking at her foot, you're pretty sure that it's going to be a diabetic ulcer because she has the typical charco foot deformity. Uh, that's one of the most common deformities that you find uh, in diabetic feet. Other common deformities, and I use the word deformity, I suppose, meaning anything out of the normal, is the formation of calluses. And again, uh, where calluses are protection on a normal foot uh, against you know hard or sharp surfaces, with a diabetic, it's just the opposite. In fact, it acts as the source of often causing a pressure. Most times when you remove a callus, you often find a very deep wound, often going to the joint that's underneath that callus. Dry skin also is a very common uh, occurrence with diabetic feet. Uh, the, the skin cracks, it allows microorganisms to get in, and hence uh, the increased rate of infections that you also generally see with diabetic feet. Bunions is another one of the most common deformities that you see. She also has, if you look at her toes, not too bad, kind of this toe and this one here. So they call tip-top toe deformity. Essentially, the toe is bent. So not only do you often see wounds occurring on the bottom of their toes as they dig their toes into their shoe, but also the top of their uh, foot rubs on shoes unless they have the extra depth shoes that the diabetics can have. Another common deformity, of course, as a result of the bunion, is that the gray toe has now gone over and therefore has resulted, unfortunately, as you see, in probably um, a stage three pressure ulcer just from, as it says, the pressure of the great toe rubbing on it. Um, this lady is going to have surgery to fix her toe, so it doesn't do this, but the surgeon doesn't want to fix her toe until all her wounds so you're kind of sometimes caught between a rock and a hard place mm -hmm. is the toe is making the wound worse, harder to heal, and yet we can't get it fixed because he wants the wound. So what we're doing essentially is trying very sundry methods as we can, something to keep essentially her toes separate. Foam tends to compress, gauze falls out. So we're now getting ready to try some of those little manicurist foam things that uh, the patient brought in today so we can see. So that's going to be the secret. And the difficulty, of course, in healing uh, not only diabetics but wounds on their toes is the further from the heart, the, the less circulation you have, even though she has very strong pulses, a nice warm foot. Being diabetic, she has a lot of uh, micro damage in, in um, the blood vessels that go into the foot. Again, another typical deformity is kind of these dystrophic looking toenails that you see again very common in the diabetic foot. Flattened, flattened arch, of course, is a result of the charco foot. And the charco foot generally is a fracturing of the small bones of the foot resulting in to that. Okay. And how will you treat it? We're going to be treating this wound uh, with electrical stimulation. Uh, not only will it help uh, increase the circulation, but it also has, um, where it's also good with venous wounds, is it decreases microvessel leakage. Um, it also has bacterial static effects uh, on several organisms. But what electrical stim specifically, it kind of jump starts the wound back into the healing process. The body has an electrical field normally within it. And when these wounds become chronic, the cells often become senescent. They essentially forget how to start healing again. So uh, the electrical stem will help promote the formation of the granulation tissue, uh, increases, helps increase its tensile strength. It also is going to help promote epidermal cell uh, proliferation, which is all what we're going to need for various forms. Right now we need to get rid of the necrotic tissue, we need to promote the formation of healthy tissues, and then uh, work on epithelial cells to cover. But the key, like I say with anything, we can put the fanciest, most expensive dressings on any pressure wound, but unless you relieve the pressure, it's not going to get well. And that's mm -hmm. the bottom line. That's why prevention is such an important spot with any type of bony prominence on diabetics as well as any type of healthy patient. Okay, thank you. So we use two pads on her. We have a machine here. bigger one is the ground plate. Mm -hmm. 
All that simply does is connect the circuit. So we just simply have a warm, you know, a moist cloth underneath it. As long as they're about at least four inches apart, they're not mm -hmm. going to interfere with uh, the voltage. Because she has two, we essentially use a splitter. Your ground plate needs to be at least twice the size of your active electrodes. So if she had just one wound, I could use approximately a, a ground plate half that size. It doesn't matter if it's bigger, it just mm -hmm. has to be at least that. So with two, especially it's the sum of the two, so it's important that we use the larger electrode for her. You can also use aluminum foil as electrodes. Hmm. If I have wounds that are highly infected, even though we do disinfect these against, you know, the hospital germicidal, you know, kills almost every germ in the world. Um, I use the aluminum foil for those ones just for um, ease of not having to go through the disinfecting process. Mm -hmm. It helps my aid, you know, mm -hmm. avoid fossil contamination, cross-contamination, and everything like that. So just out of convenience. So when I was doing home health, it was a lot easier because I was in a car and much more mm -hmm. difficult to, um, to disinfect. And depending on the phase of healing that the wound is in, uh, depends on the setting and from um, research they've determined which phases appear to be. There's really no 100% um, agreement because they're not, different studies have different ones, but generally they know negative or positive for which healing. So she, because she has some necrotic tissue, she's going to be negative. Uh, again, the pulses per second vary again on what the wound's looking like, so she's going down to 30 pulses per second. The intensity uh, recommended is between 100 and 150. However, it is supposed to be uh, comfortable. If the patient complains of 100, then I won't have it up that high. In fact, I have a patient that can only tolerate 70. Uh, people do have different um, effects to electrical stimulation. Some are much more sensitive than others. So most people don't feel it. This uh, it's a very comfortable waveform. Uh, sometimes they feel a mild tingling. This isn't. This is different from the type of electrical stim that you see for muscle re-education, which is like I said, this is called high voltage pulse current, and essentially it has that name because it has two very high spikes of current and a very long resting period, which the other currents tend not to have. So that's why it's so comfortable. It uh, has no thermal, no uh, chemical effects. So patients who are um, who might have impaired awareness or cognition, uh, I feel totally safe if they can't tell me something's uncomfortable. I know we're not going to be doing any harm to them. Some of them are generally our elderly patients. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.